Um, what I want to do is give you two words this morning, and I want to ask if you relate to these two words. All right, so I'm going to show two words. They're going to be on the screen. And as you read them, just shake your head. If you're at home, shake your head or maybe raise your hand. Can't see you, but please. And for those who are here, two words. Crisis fatigue. Has anyone felt over the last, say, six months, crisis fatigue? Just that feeling of, oh my gosh, what's going to happen next? I mean, can you imagine, like it's June 21st, 2020. At the beginning of this year, and you know, say even late December, early January, can you imagine what would have happened over the next six months? A pandemic that still today we're trying to figure out how do you live in the midst of all that's going on? I mean, like literally you have to think about going to the store now. You know, which we've never, most of us have never had to think too much about that let alone the tragedy and the loss of life that has happened in this country and around the world and the crisis that has been happening because of the pandemic. And then add into that, you know, the, the racial conflict that has been raising its head in our country and the, the questions of some foundational things in our, in, our, in our country with the police and all these things that are going on. You're like, oh my gosh, there's riots in the street. And do you guys remember the killer hornets? Right? I mean, remember those popped up on the news? You're like, what? Killer hornets? You know, like, it's the apocalypse. Because it felt, you know, I mean, just this, this feeling. And so we've been experiencing this, this crisis, but it's a continual thing that just keeps going on. And I don't know if you've ever asked the question over the last six months, what's next? I have some good news and some even better news for you. Here's the good news. We're not the only ones who have been through unprecedented times. You know that word, we've used it a lot recently. This is unprecedented, all these things. But what we know through history is there have been unprecedented times for literally millenniums. There have been times that have felt completely overwhelming to humanity, whether it was war or pandemics or racial conflict or all these things that have happened through history. And what we see in history is people who have not simply survived, but have made it through and thrived in unprecedented times. Um, I have a quotation I want to share with you. It's from a man whose name is John Newton. Some of you know John Newton's name. He was um, the man who wrote this hymn, Amazing Grace. So if you've ever sung Amazing Grace, John Newton wrote that hymn. Some of you know his story. As a young man, he was actually on a slave trade ship. He was one of the people running that ship. And then he had this massive transformation. He eventually becomes a pastor in his life, and he becomes an abolitionist. And John Newton lived through unprecedented times in his work to abolish slavery in England, which took like 30 years on so many things. And this is what he had to say about persevering or living in crisis fatigue. He wrote this. We can easily manage if we will only take each day the burden appointed to it. But the load will be too heavy for us if we carry yesterday's burden over and again today and then add the burden of the morrow before we are required to bear it. All right, he speaks very differently than we speak today. Let me break it down like this. Today has enough trouble of its own. Don't worry about tomorrow or yesterday. Live today. Listen, listen again how he said this, because this was written in the 1700s and how needed these words are for us. We can easily manage if we only take each day the burden appointed to it. The load will be too heavy for us if we carry yesterday's burden over again today and then add the burden of the morrow before we are required to bear it. Like if we're going to carry the pain of the past, it's going to make today too heavy. Or if we're going to carry the pain or the unexpected future, it's going to make today too heavy. What we have is, all we have is today. 
And we know more now than probably we've known much of our lives. We never know what tomorrow will bring. Things are shifting, it feels like, a lot recently, quickly. But you see this, this idea of unprecedented times or crisis fatigue, um, it's been around even longer than the 1700s. In the book of James, which we've been studying, the, the book literally begins when you face various trials, when you face various difficulties, you know, you will be blessed when you persevere. He, he, like, he, he leads with that. One of the gifts that we've had studying the book of James is James literally is writing to a people who are living through unprecedented times. In that first century, there was the government was going crazy, there was oppression, there was all this racial conflict, there was all kinds of things happening. And that's who he's writing to. And his call to the Christian church is to persevere. We looked at this weeks ago in James chapter 1, verse 12, it says this, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. So James makes it super clear. He says, you are blessed when you persevere. Now, what James means by persevere is not that we have this resolve to make it. What James means by persevere is you never let go of God. Like for James, perseverance isn't just kind of making it through a hard time. It's that in that hard time, you never let go of God. Like you hang in there. Because when we go through hard times, we have a lot of questions. And he goes, and when you persevere, you will be blessed because you have withstood the test. It literally means like you've been added, this added value. You can see the value of your faith because you persevered in a very difficult time. You haven't let go of faith. And he says there's a promise of the crown of life. There's like this blessing. There's a blessing for people of faith when we persevere. We never let go of God in the midst of the difficult times that we face. And that's always been true. And it's just as true today as it was 2,000 years ago or so when James wrote this letter. So what we're going to look at today, we're in James chapter 5. And what you're going to see in James chapter 5 is... a. Uh, He's going to call us to persevere and he's going, to, he's going to give us, consider some examples from the Old Testament. And one of the th examples he's going to give is the person whose name is Job. Anybody, raise your hand if you remember Job. Anybody remember Job from the Old Testament? Um, he's going to say, look at Job because Job persevered and he received what God had for him. He received mercy and compassion. So what I thought we would do before we jump into our text from James is we're going to take a little excursion into the book of Job. So then when we get to James, we'll know what James is talking about. It's pretty, it's pretty interesting how when we read the New Testament, we can um, read quickly and not think about what we're reading. So what I want to do is just slow us down and think about what we're reading when it comes to Job and how Job persevered in very difficult times. Okay, so for those of you who don't know Job, let me introduce you to Job. Job, um, it's described in Job chapter 1 that he was the greatest man who lived in the East. So he was a very well-known and respected man. He was a man who followed God intently and intensely. He was a guy who followed the commands because he knew the promise of the commands. Follow God and you will be blessed. Don't follow God and you will be cursed, like it said in Deuteronomy. So he followed God and he was blessed. Check this out. He had 7,000 sheep. He had 3,000 camels. He had 500 yoke of oxen, and he had 500 donkeys, and he had more servants that he could count. He was a rich person in the first, uh, well, not the first century, way, way beyond the first century. This man was a rich person. So he had all this stuff, and he was faithful to God. Oh, and his family. Guess how many sons he had? Any guesses? 
Yes, he had seven sons. Good job, Ramon. And guess how many daughters he had? He had three daughters. Good job, Carol. Seven sons, three daughters. And so this is what happens to Job. Super, and lots of prestige. Job would walk into the room, and people would want to listen to his wisdom. If you were poor, who do you go to? Go to Job. Job takes care of the poor. We see that in the book. So there's a gathering in heaven where the angels gather before God. And at this gathering, Satan, um, Satan, shows up. Um, that word there, Satan or Satan, it means accuser. And so he shows up to this gathering of angels. And then God says to Satan, where have you been? He goes, I've been traveling to and fro around the world. And God says, man, you should consider my servant Job. And Satan says, dude. Well, he didn't say dude. He says, Job is only faithful because he has all that stuff. You take all that away and he will curse God. And then God literally says to Satan in this book of Job, he says, you can take it away, but don't touch him. And then in one day, it says that enemies came in and devastated all of his livestock. Actually, one of the stories is there was a great lightning storm and there was the, all, some of the other livestock, I think it was the sheep, were destroyed. So he lost all the camel, all the sheep, all the donkeys, all the oxen. And then there was a mighty wind that came to this house where his kids were partying, celebrating, and it crushed them all. So in one day, Job loses everything. He has a wife and a couple servants left. Um, and this is his response. So this is at the end of Job chapter 1. This is how Job responds. At this, Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head. He then fell to the ground in worship and said, Naked I came to my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. His first response after losing all of his livestock, all of his, all of his family, except for his wife, is to praise God. God gives, God takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord. Now that's not unusual for a people of faith when we've experienced a very difficult thing to say, I'm fine, I'm trusting God. It's not unusual. It's not unusual if you've lived a life of faith when something hard happens for you to literally say, I'm going to be okay. I'm going to praise God in the pain. I've seen literally people in our sanctuary. They've lost loved ones in tragic ways. And the next Sunday they stand to praise God. It's not unusual for that to happen. But it is unusual if it ends there. Because remember, this is just Job chapter 1. So listen what happens next. So next, there's another gathering in heaven with the angels, and Satan shows up again, and God says, where have you been? He goes, I've been traveling to and fro. And then God says, hey, check out Job. Still praising God after losing all that stuff. Satan goes, that's nothing. If you were to harm his body, take away his health, he will curse you. And God says, you can do that, just don't take his life. And listen to what happens in Job chapter 2. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the top of his head. Then Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it as he sat among the ashes. He said, his wife said to him, are you still holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. And Job replied, you are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In all this, Job did not sin in what he said. So again, you have this response from Job. So now his body is literally covered with sores from his feet to his head. Like he's, the itch so bad, he's scraping it with pottery. And his wife looks at him and says, you've got all, everything. God is obviously cursing you. Look at this. Everything's being taken away. Curse God and die. And he's like, 
hey man, am I only going to be stay faithful to God when it's good? When it's hard, I'm going to stay faithful. Job chapter 2. You have this man who is a trying and you would have, it would appear succeeding in persevering and hanging on to God. But I would, I would say, like, if Job was only two chapters long, it would be a very discouraging book. Because it's unusual and not maybe even impossible to have pain and loss and to simply stay faithful. And what we see in Job chapter 3 through 42, so literally the next 40 chapters, we begin to see Job's pain and his perseverance. See, what happens next in Job's life, he, so he's totally devastated. Everything's going on. And then three of his friends show up. So three friends show up in order to help Job because he, they, he's experienced this crisis. He's experienced this in, uh, just this horrid set, um, circumstances. And it's interesting, it says when those friends show up, do you guys remember what the friends do? The friends show up and literally, they see how bad off he is, and all they can do is sit with him. They sit in silence for seven days. It says they entered into the dirt, and they just sat. And then they began to speak. Job is now at the place where the pain is not going away. He is seeking to stay faithful to God, but the pain is still there. There are times in our lives where we pursue God with faithfulness out of loss, out of grief, out of crisis, and something happens, like there's a, something goes on when the pain doesn't go away. We find ourselves praying, but it doesn't go away. And then we find ourselves questioning, why isn't this pain going away? I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, and the pain is still here. If you've ever been in chronic pain, not for a day, not for a week, but if you've been in chronic pain for a long time, you begin to understand what Job is about to experience. He's feeling it, and he doesn't understand. And what his friends do is his friends actually say, Job, let me tell you why you're going through this pain. Because just like Job used to tell others, he knows what the Hebrew scriptures say. Do good and you will be blessed. Do bad and you will be cursed. So his friends are like, okay, so Job, what'd you do? And he's like, I didn't do anything. Well, obviously you're suffering for a reason, but I didn't do anything. I, I know what you're talking about. I didn't do any of that. And they're like, Job, come on, man. Where's your sin? What did you do wrong? And Job is just so tired of these men trying to give him these platitudes of faith because it doesn't make sense to him. In fact, in Job chapter 13, this is how he responds to his friends who are trying to say, this, tell us what's wrong, Job. And he says this, My eyes have seen all this. My ears have heard and understood it. In other words, they're saying, Job's like, I get what you're trying to tell me. I've said the same thing to people who are suffering. What you know, I also know. Am I inferior to you? Then Job says this, check it out. But I desire to speak to the Almighty and to argue my case with God. Like Job is like, I'm going to God. I'm going through a hard time. I'm going to persevere, but I'm going to God. I do not need religious platitudes. I do not need someone to tell me their experience. What I need to do is I need to go to God. And listen to what he says to his friends. You, however, smear me with lies. You are worthless physicians, all of you. If you would be altogether silent, for you, that would be wisdom. I don't know if you've ever had that. You're, you are in a super hard spot. And people are trying to tell you their religious platitude, the thing that's supposed to make you feel better. And you're like, shh. I know what it says. I've studied the scripture too. 
You want wisdom right now, friend? Shh. Just be quiet. And Job, he's way beyond Job chapter 1 and 2. Because he gave some religious truth and almost a platitude. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. But Job's chronic pain does not free him. And he simply wants to run to God. He actually almost demands it. I do not need what you have. I need to talk to God. And so that's Job chapter 13. And you see this dialogue between his friends and him. It just keeps going on. And finally, Job has had enough of it. And in Job chapter 27, it says this. And Job continued his discourse. As surely as God lives, who has denied me justice, the Almighty, who has made me taste bitterness of soul, as long as, I live, as long as I have life within me, the breath of God in my nostrils, my lips will not speak wickedness, my tongue will not utter deceit. He's like, he's way beyond Job chapter 2. When his wife says, why don't you curse God? And he's like, no, why? God gives, God takes away. Why should I not be thankful? He's like, God has been unjust to me. Did you see that? That's heavy. As surely as God lives, who has denied me justice, the Almighty, who has made me taste bitterness of soul. He's like, God has brought me here. He is way beyond Job chapter 1 and 2. But notice what he doesn't do. He never denies God. He perseveres. He doesn't stop holding on. But he brings his pain. In fact, it goes on to say this. I will never admit to you that you are right till I die. He's talking to his friends or saying, you must have done something wrong. I will not deny my integrity I will maintain my righteousness and never let go of it. My conscience will not reproach me as long as I live. Job is like, I did everything right. I didn't do anything wrong. I will not deny my righteousness nor my integrity. This is between me and God. And it's actually, it's interesting because he like, he calls God to the carpet almost like he like he's like i want to have a court case and god's on trial you measure my life god and you tell me what i did wrong well see what i love about job is he never gives up on god man sometimes perseverance i would say it's all the time if we are to persevere we're called to live a life of outrageous prayer, like brutal honesty before God. Okay, now, if you guys know the story, you know what happens next. Like, he calls God out, and guess who shows up? Any guesses? God shows up. God shows up. And, and God shows up in such a way where he says, and who are you, Job, to question me? Job, where were you? Were you there when I was putting together the universe? Job, were you there when I set the stars in the sky? Job, were you there when I set up the lightning bolts that were going to eventually be used in the storehouse of lightning bolts? Job, were you there when I made all of this? Job, were you there when I made the creatures that you're afraid of? All the big animals in the world. Where were you, Job? Because those animals are nothing to me. I hold the keys of the universe. God never answers the question of Job's suffering. Job receives something better. God. He receives a God who is full of love and compassion and mercy. 
See, in his prayer, Job wanted relief, and God showed up. In fact, that's what happens in Job chapter 42. Listen, listen to Job's response. So this is an image that was painted by an artist in terms of God speaking. Listen to, what Job, God says to, listen to what Job says to the Lord in verse 42. After God calls it out, he says this. I know that you can do all things. No plans of yours can be thwarted. It's like you see this humility kicking in for Job. He's no longer claiming his righteousness. He's like, okay, you can do all things. You asked, who is it that obscures my counsel without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. You see this, you see a Job. The Job of chapter 1 and 2 is a Job who is now encountering a God who absolutely loves him, and you see his humility kicking in. Job is like, okay, I, I overspoke. You said, listen now, and I will speak. I will question, and you shall answer me. That's what God said to Job. And then look at this verse. My ears have heard you, but now my eyes have seen you. Job has spent a lifetime hearing what he should do and living a life that he needed. And he goes, but now I see who you truly are. And this is his response in seeing God. Therefore, I despise myself and I repent in dust and ashes. He went from raising a fist to God saying, I want to take you to court. God showed up. God simply said, this is who I am. I created it all. And then Job is like this. I now see you, God. And I turn from my righteousness and I repent. And Job never gave up. Job persevered. He persevered. And what I find so fascinating about Job's life is Job never says, heal me from my pain. Job says, I need justice. And God gave him himself. In order to persevere, we are called to be people of outrageous prayer. In order to persevere in the tragedy and the unprecedented times in our lives, whether that's like life in terms of as a country and all the craziness that can happen, or when life is simply unprecedented, meaning things are happening to us that we've never experienced before. Grief, loss, pain, trials, tribulation, betrayal. When all of that happens, how do we persevere? Well, if we're using Job as an example, we never let go of God, and we're brutally honest with God. We need some outrageous prayer. So now in James chapter 5, where we find ourselves from our study in the book of James, he says this in verse 10, Brothers and sisters, he's talking about being faithful in hard times, persevering in hard times. He says, Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we consider blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. So when James is calling the early church to persevere in difficult times, he says, man, we already know this. Like when you look back on the Old Testament, look at the prophets. They were speakers for God. They were the ones who were God's mouthpiece and they suffered hard times, but they didn't give up. They stayed with it. And let me give you another example, Job. You guys know Job's story right now pretty well, huh? Let me tell you about Job. Job serves as an example. I love how he says it. Um, you have heard of Job's perseverance. Quick, oh, quick comment. You know, you ever hear that phrase, they've got the patience of Job? Anyone hear that phrase? That, that phrase does not connect to Scripture. 
What Job had was perseverance. I think sometimes people use that phrase like, oh, you got to be patient, you got to endure. Man, Job, Job was honest with God. He was honest with life. He persevered. That's what James says. Okay, so it's good. So have you heard of Job's perseverance and have you seen what the Lord finally brought about? I forgot to tell you what happened after that. So Job repents, he, he finds himself, and then what you see in the rest of chapter 42 of Job is God restores his life in many ways. With wealth, with family again, there's a restoration in Job's life. But Job is not the same person of chapters 1 and 2. Job is not that same person who could quickly say to the one who suffers, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job Job is now the one who says, yeah, it's hard, but God is good. And, And I think we understand that. Have you ever heard someone say you know my life is really hard but I wouldn't change a thing I wouldn't change a thing because the suffering that I experienced made me the person who I am today I am a transformed person because God was faithful in my life I mean you think about if you were here for graduation Sunday when Sophia Lewis gave her testimony when Caitlin gave her testimony if you heard their testimony that's exactly what they were saying as 18-year-olds, they were saying, I've been through some hard times, but I wouldn't change it because God is shaping me to be the person he has me to be. That's what we see in Job. So how do we persevere? James is going to kind of lay it out. James is going to lay it out. And essentially, I'm just going to say it again. If we want to persevere, we are called to be people of outrageous prayer. If we want to persevere, we're called to pray outrageously because that's where James takes us. So James goes on, he says this, Above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear by heaven or by earth or by anything else. Let your yes be yes yes, and your no be no, or you will be condemned. Is there anyone in trouble? He should pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. It's just such a, so James is walking us through how do we persevere. And he says, well, consider Job, and you see how God was faithful to him. And then he says, oh, above all, just, just say yes and just say no, whatever you're, whatever you're going to say to. If you're going through hard times, don't make any grand promises before God. Like, don't stand up there and say, God, if, if you bring me through this, I swear on the name of my Father that I will never leave you again, 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 again. James is like, dude, don't do that. Because you will fail again. Don't swear on something greater than you. Because you're just condemning yourself. Do you guys remember when Peter did that? Um, at the, the night that Jesus was betrayed, they were in the upper room. Do you remember what Peter said? Peter goes, Lord, I'm willing to die for you. I'm willing to do whatever you need. I swear to God. Jesus is like, shh. Before it's morning, you're going to deny me three times. We don't don't have to make any of these dramatic promises. Because what we discover in the life of faith is it's not about our faithfulness. It's about God's faithfulness. God has already said yes. So what we need to do is just say yes or just say no. And then not let go. Because that's where James takes us. He says, now the first thing he says after that, is any one of you in trouble? You should pray. And now, when we hear the word pray in the context of the story of Job, this isn't like just give God your grocery list of need. That's not what prayer is in this context. Is any one of you in trouble? Hang on to God. Don't let go. Bring him who you are. And God shows up. 
James has this other promise. He says, draw near to God and God will draw near to you. When you're going through a hard time, of course pray for your healing. Of course pray for what you need, for sure. But it's not about that. It's about knowing who God is. That's what prayer does. Prayer brings us into his presence. God is so much greater than we can imagine. His blessings are so much more than we can even think or imagine. But the greatest blessing is knowing the one who blesses. If you've ever been in that place of trouble, that place of pain, bring it to God. Outrageously be honest with God. He will meet you. Sometimes he's going to sustain you for a long time through a difficult thing. Sometimes he'll take it away. That's where James takes us. James takes perseverance. If we want to persevere, we are called to become people of outrageous prayer. And what's interesting, though, he, like, he says, bring in all the God, be totally honest like Job was. And then he says this, if any one of you is happy, you should sing praise. Like, I love that image. He goes from like trouble to praise because that's our life. I mean, there are times in our lives where things are good. And it's interesting that sometimes in the good times, it's easy to forget about God. You guys ever had that experience? Going through a hard time, you're like, oh, I need God. I got to go back to church. All of a sudden, life is good. I can't make it. I got to go surf. Or whatever you do. But James is like, man, if you're going to be persevere, when you're having a good day, praise God. Put your focus back on God. Sing him praises. Let it go. Just sing. That's so good. Like, I love that. I, so one of my favorite memories as a dad is uh, years ago, uh, my oldest son was four years old. And uh, I was walking through the house, and I heard someone singing in the house. And... Um, I thought it was Hope or Faith, one of the girls. Um, it was a high voice, and, and I was looking around, and, and then I, I peek open the door, and it's my oldest son, and he's just singing. Just singing. No, not making any sense, just singing, making up a song. And guess what that did to my heart? I just wanted to start singing with him. It was so joyful, like it was crazy joyful, because my son was just in a place of joy, And he was just singing. And I wonder about the heart of God. Like when we just sing, man, give him praise. Let it go. If we want to persevere, we are called to be people of outrageous prayer. Now listen to where James goes next. It's interesting where he takes us. This is what he says next. Is any one of you sick... He should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So, we, so far, we have, if you're in trouble, pray. If you're happy, sing. And then he says, well, if you're going to be people of prayer, we need each other in this. Because if you're at a place where you need healing, he doesn't say just pray for healing. What does he say? He says, go and talk to the community. Go find people who can pray for you. There are times in our lives we need healing, emotional, spiritual, physical, whatever it might be. And we can't even pray ourselves because we're, we're trying to persevere, but we're in a super slow, a low spot. And James was like, you can't do this on your own. You don't persevere on your own. You were not made to do it on your own. God did not create you to do it on your own. In fact, the only thing problem in creation was that the man was on his own. God's like, I've got to solve that problem. Let's give him a woman and let's create family. We're not made to do it on our own. He goes, go and pray. There's a great passage of scripture in Luke chapter 5. Uh, it's a story where there's a man who's paralytic. He can't walk and he needs to be healed. 
But he obviously can't do it on his own because Jesus is teaching in a house. Maybe you guys remember the story. Jesus is teaching in a house and it's really crowded. So four friends, literally four friends, pick this guy up and they take him to Jesus. Do you guys remember the story? And so they pick him up and they carry him. They get to the house, but it's super crowded. So what do they do? Right? They go up on the roof and they dig a hole and they drop this guy. They don't drop the guy, but they lower the guy. They lower the guy at the feet of Jesus. And do you remember what Jesus said? Well, Luke records this. He says this. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the man, your sins are forgiven. Like it had nothing to do with the faith of the man. And it had everything to do with the faith of the friends who literally carried him to Christ. If we want to persevere, we are called to be people of outrageous prayer together. This is not a solo event. Sometimes, um, sometimes our pride gets in the way of us seeking healing. There are times when our pride says, I'm fine. There are others who might need prayer, but I'll be okay because I trust God and I have my own strength. And it's, sometimes I think God is screaming from heaven, stop it. Humble yourself. Find prayer. I want to heal you. I want to free you from that sin, whatever it might be. But our pride gets in the way. And I know that because scripture points to it. And man, I'm like number one on that list. It's so hard sometimes to ask for prayer. And we know we need help. Like if we're feeling the fatigue of a crisis, whether it's a personal crisis or the bigger picture, we need one another to pray for one another. So uh, like a week ago Saturday, I was just, uh, I mentioned last week, but a week ago Saturday was just a really low day for me. It was super heavy. I'm feeling the crisis of stuff and a lot of things were going on. And um, I spent the morning or the mid-afternoon, I just had to get away. So I went down to the, no, this is, so Saturday was a really low day and I was still feeling it on Monday. I went down to the beach last Monday. And I was hanging out and I'm reading a book and I knew for certain that God wanted me to call a friend of mine who runs this healing ministry and ask for prayer. Like I knew for certain. And I'm at the beach, and I'm like, oh, no, I send people to get healing. I don't go for healing myself. You know, but then, man, it's so useless to be prideful before God. It just doesn't, it doesn't help. And so, I, like, I called my buddy. Her name is Jill. Jill does this healing rooms. It's in Thousand Oaks. And I said, hey, Jill, can I come in tonight for some prayer? And ends up, I was able to set up an appointment for these folks to pray for me. I didn't, and... Uh, it was a Zoom meeting. Zoom. Prayer via Zoom. I showed up and they were praying for me via Zoom. And I, and I just want to testify today. God works through the internet. And these people were praying for me and my pride was just breaking. I had some confessing to do because it's funny when you, when you go to God for healing, often he'll show you those areas in our lives that you need to confess and and there was just this healing that was happening in my heart and in my life. Then that's where James takes us. I mean, like these guys take this guy to Jesus and he says, your sins are forgiven, and then he heals him. And James makes the same connection. He says, if he has sinned, he will be forgiven. He says, therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. See, prayer, um, it includes bringing God our trouble and committing that to him. Prayer includes singing. Prayer includes asking for healing. And prayer also, this outrageous prayer, includes confession with one another. Because when we are going through unprecedented times, we begin to see things inside of us that we didn't even know existed. Our lack of kindness, our lack of impatience, different things that happen inside of us. And we start feeling guilty about those things. And as we're going through this crisis of trying to persevere, God says, don't carry the guilt. Confess your sin to one another and find forgiveness. You got you to confess it, guys. Women, all of us, you got to confess it.
I think as Protestants, we have a hard time with confessing sin to each other. Because we don't want to be Catholic. I think one of the gifts of the Catholic Church is the confessional. Because you're expressing your, your sin to another person who therefore grants forgiveness. But the, thing, the thing is, is that we don't need a priest. The priest is not the only one we can confess to. We can confess to one another. That's what the scripture says. And there's something that happens when we speak the words out loud. I confess this to whoever you're speaking to. And when they look at you and they say, Jesus Christ died for those sins. You are forgiven because of Christ's work on the cross. There's nothing you have to do to earn forgiveness. Just know that you're forgiven. Because like, if we have a community that confesses sin to one another, we have a community that lives in the power of God's love and not the shame of guilt that brings us down. That's, that's where James has taken us. That's why Job had to repent. Did you get that at the end there? That's why Job had to repent. Even though he was the victim in all of this. Because he wasn't just a victim. He also had his pride. He had to give it all up. And so like when we do that, what we learn is that God shapes us as people of prayer and then we can live into what God has for us. So it ends with, uh, with this word. It says the prayer of a righteous man, a prayer of the righteous person is powerful and effective. That's where we're going next week. So come back next week because we're going to lean into what prayer of a righteous person looks like. And remember, righteousness is not because we do all the right things. Righteousness is because we confess our sins. We receive healing. We sing praise to God. We, we persevere in prayer. That's where righteousness comes from. Don't be Job of chapter 1 and 2. Be Job chapter 42. That's where God's calling us. If we want to persevere, we are called to be people of outrageous prayer together. So this, uh, this whole week, as I've been working on this text and just processing my own spiritual life, but, but also just thinking for us as a country, thinking for us as a community, um, there's a hymn that just kept coming back over and over, um, that hymn what a friend we have in Jesus. It's, it's a powerful hymn that, that calls us. Well, let me, just, let me just remind you of the words. It starts off, what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege it is to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Man, that's the good news. And because it's Father's Day, I want to make a special appeal to the men who can hear this. Guys, we have been trained to be strong. We have been trained to be the ones who say, I'm okay. We want to be strong for our kids. We want to be strong for our spouses, we want to be strong for the community. That's Job chapter 1 and 2. See, the strength of a Christian man, father, grandfather, uncle, mentor, the strength comes in our weakness. Because it's when we are weak, when we are completely broken before God, that's when God lifts us up. And if you, if we want to train our daughters and our sons, our grandsons and our granddaughters, 
If we want to train them to know God, we need to demonstrate that brokenness before God. That's a truth for everybody, not just men. Of course, it's for men and women. But because it's Father's Day, I'm going to call out us fathers. Let's be Job chapter 42. Let's be outrageous in our prayer. And even if you don't want to do it for yourself, do it for your kids. All the children who are watching. And then what you'll find is you won't even care about the kids at one point because you'll just be stoked you did it for yourself. Because you'll be like, oh, finally I'm free. <laughs> I'm fully free. Ah, that feels good. And then what you'll find is kids at one point because you'll just be stoked. <laughs>